Welcome to the house of the Lord as we gather together to worship our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Our call to worship from Isaiah 60. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are the light of the world, and that you have come, and that you call us to live and to walk in your light and to share that light with those around. We pray this in your name. We open this service in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Our order of service continues as printed in the bulletin. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And let us humbly kneel or bow, confess our sins unto the Lord. Almighty God, our Maker and Redeemer, we poor sinners confess unto Thee that we are by nature sinful and unclean, that we have sinned against Thee by thought, word, and deed. Wherefore, we flee for refuge to Thine infinite mercy, seeking and imploring Thy grace, for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. O most merciful God, who has given thine only begotten Son to die for us, have mercy upon us, and for his sake grant us remission of all our sins. And by thy Holy Spirit, increase in us true knowledge of thee and of thy will, and true obedience to thy word, that by thy grace we may come to everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Almighty and merciful God grant unto you being penitent, pardon and remission from all your sins, time for amendment of life, and the grace and comfort of his Holy Spirit. Let us please stand together. Our introit for this Septuagesima Sunday is printed there in your bulletin. Let us read that together responsibly. The sorrows of death compassed me. He heard my voice out of his temple. I will love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress. Show me world without end. Have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. The Lord has indeed had mercy and grace upon us, which he showed us so richly at the cross, but again new each and every day. And so let us sing to the praise of his name, but as a prayer, the song, Take My Life and Let It Be.
The Lord be with you. Let's continue to pray. O Lord, we ask you to favorably hear the prayers of your people, that we who are justly punished for our offenses may be mercifully delivered by your goodness for the glory of your name. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Ghost, one God, world without end. Please be seated. Our Old Testament lesson, which is printed there in your bulletin, is from Isaiah chapter 58, beginning with verse 3. Isaiah the prophet writes the word of the Lord, Why have we fasted and you do not see? Why have we humbled ourselves and you do not notice? Behold, on the day of your fast you will find your desire, and drive hard all your workers. Behold, you fast for contention and strife, and to strike with a wicked fist. You do not fast like you do today, to make your voice heard on high. Is it a fast like this which I chose, a day for a man to humble himself? Is it for bowing one's head like a reed, and for spreading out sackcloth and ashes as a bed? Will you call this a fast, even an acceptable day to the Lord? Is this not the fast which I choose, to loosen the bonds of wickedness, to undo the bands of the yoke, and to let the oppressed go free and break every yoke? Is it not to divide your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into the house, when you see the naked to cover him, and not to hide yourself from your own flesh? Then your light will break out like the dawn, and your recovery will speedily spring forth, and your righteousness will go before you, and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call, and the Lord will answer. You will cry, and he will say, Here I am. Here ends our Old Testament lesson. Our psalm printed there, Psalm 112. Let us read that together responsively. Praise the Lord. How blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who greatly delights in his commandments. Wealth and riches are in his house, and his righteousness endures forever. Light arises in the darkness for the upright. He is gracious and compassionate and righteous. For he will never be shaken. The righteous will be remembered forever. His heart is upheld. He will not fear until he looks with satisfaction on his adversaries. Here ends our psalm. Our epistle lesson, coming again from 1 Corinthians, although we're taking a pause today in our series through 1 Corinthians, but again our lesson here from chapter 2. St. Paul writes, And when I came to you, brothers, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. Yet we do speak wisdom among those who are mature. A wisdom, however, not of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are passing away. But we speak God's wisdom in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God predestined before the ages to our glory, the wisdom which none of the rulers of this age has understood. For if they had understood it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But just as it is written, things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard, and which have not entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. For to us God revealed them through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the Spirit of the man which is in him? Even so the thoughts of God no one knows except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God. Here ends our epistle lesson. A gradual reading this morning, the Lord also will be a refuge for the oppressed, a refuge in times of trouble, and they that know your name will put their trust in you. For you, Lord, have not forsaken them that seek you, for the needy shall not always be forgotten, 
The expectation of the poor shall not perish forever. Arise, O Lord, let not man prevail. He rends our gradual reading. Holy Gospel lessons from the Gospel of Matthew, the fifth chapter, beginning with verse 13. Reading in Jesus' name. And Jesus said, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished." Whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. Here ends our gospel lesson. Let us confess together our holy Christian faith by the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Before you're seated, take just a moment to greet those next to you. Thank you. You may be seated at this time. It's a delight to welcome each of you here this morning. A special welcome to those visiting with us today. McMinns, I don't really count you visitors. You still are members of our our church. Absolutely. And uh, just invite everyone to take the red friendship folder and to sign that and pass it down to those next to you that might have a record of your participation in worship service uh, this morning. I want to thank Janine for the, the flowers uh, on the altar as we remember Greg and, and just the blessing of, of his life and with the Lord though now. And then also just want to um, say th- thank you, Sadie, for filling in at the last minute as well, too, as a, as a cruise for this morning. It's great to have young people so willing to jump in and, and serve that way. Uh, as you notice, the McMinn family is, is with us today, Bryce and Aaron and their children. Great to have them here. And uh, that, for, for a couple reasons, uh, one is that they were going to be on vacation here anyway and traveling, visiting family all the way from Roseau, Minnesota, about six miles from Canada. And so they're here um, thawing out a little bit as well. So that, that's good news. But, but also, as our call committee has been, been working very diligently and interviewing candidates and so forth, uh, just this last Monday, the call committee uh, unanimously recommended to the council uh, that um, we go forward and to ask the McMinns to candidate and then to put that forth before the congregation. And so uh, nothing like candidating on your vacation. So we're glad that that worked out. And Bryce is going to be giving the message this morning. And we just praise God for that. We feel like we've been partnering with them all along as they've been going through seminary as well, too, and now coming to the end of that seminary uh, journey. But waiting upon the Lord for God's direction uh, for them. And in, in two weeks, then, we'll have a congregational meeting following the, the services as well, too, uh, in, in voting on um, extending a call that way. 
Now, you also noticed that this morning that uh, Vicar uh, Brian and, and Allie Westerberg are not here. And Vicar Westerberg is away at, preaching at another church candidating. And uh, in these last uh, just few weeks, he's sensed more and more that, that God is calling them uh, to, to go to a different church. Uh, and, and so God has been, I mean, we've been praying for, for months and months and months. And now it seems like all of a sudden God is like bringing things uh, together in a very quick time as well, too. So we want to continue to be prayerful that way uh, for each one involved and for our congregation uh, as well. Also, I just uh, mentioned this morning that uh, for this coming year, we're not going to be having a- another vicar, which we, have, we haven't always done, but in the last number of years we have. So it's kind of become routine for us, but we're not. But we're going to be uh, just focusing on uh, building our pastoral team here and, and focusing that way as well this, this coming year. So just to, to note that as well. And then be in prayer for a number of individuals. And I'm going to call the, the kids to come up during this time as I uh, list these individuals. Come up for the object lesson. And, um, but to be praying for, for Debbie Scundrich and Debbie's husband, Ray, uh, passed away suddenly on, on Friday um, from a heart attack. It was very unexpected and sudden. So we want to be praying for the, the Scundrich family today. Uh, also, Dick Hummel's. Uh, funeral was on Friday, so please continue to pray for the Hummel family. Also pray for Dick Thomas. His health has been failing uh, rather rapidly uh, just recently, so pray for Dick Thomas. Uh, John Bender is also in the hospital. He fell, broke some ribs, also damaged a lung, uh, so please pray for for John Bender. Uh, Janine Kruth is going through cancer treatment. She was here this morning at first service, but pray for God's strength for her. And then also Glenn Hughes uh, is having a liver biopsy tomorrow, so pray for for Glenn. And and I want to wish uh, Bob Christman happy birthday, 94, is that right, Bob? Yes, congratulations, wonderful. And then also, reminder... Uh, about the uh, the baby bottles. Uh, today was the day to bring them them back, and uh, maybe you're thinking, oh, I forgot it at home. I know exactly where it is. You know what? We'll still take it next Sunday. Okay, so bring those back, and this is a great way for us to, to bless the, the Women's Center right here in our neighborhood that way, and I'm so glad that we are a congregation that loves God's gift of life. And, and then just want to continue to Encourage you to uphold our, our leaders, our council meets tomorrow, uphold them in prayer as well as, as God is at work here in, in so many ways. So this time, all ready for the object lesson. Well, it's good to see you all. You see, I have something here with me. What is that? It's a boat, the ark. Yeah, you've got it more specifically. It's kind of a model of Noah's ark as sold at Walmart. And uh, the one thing I like about this model is that it has the, you can see the the individual boards. They made it look like you can see all the different individual boards that would have held this boat together. And God gave Noah the instructions for building this ark and used him to build it. And what happened to the people who were in the ark when the flood came? That's right, they were saved. Exactly, saved. And so imagine if some of the people who were on this ark, though, remember Noah and his wife, Yessa, no. Noah and his wife and his family were on the ark. And what if, you know, sometime during their trip, somebody on the ark had said, you know, I love the ark. It's fantastic. But there's this one part down here that really bothers me, that board right there. I'm just going to rip that out and get rid of that. What do you think would have happened? Yeah, there would have been kind of a disaster, wouldn't it? That's terrible. Well, I know sometimes it's hard to pay attention during the sermons, but try today. (laughs) And if you'll listen during the sermon, I'm going to be talking about how Jesus commands all of us to stay true to God's word, to remember that God uses his word to save our souls, and that Jesus says in the sermon text today that not one little piece of his word will pass away that he uses his word to save us. And it's not really for us who are being saved by the word of God to say, well, you know, I don't like that part right there. So I'm going to rip that part out. And then there's a part over here that I don't like, and we'll tear that out. Disaster comes from that too. So we'll talk in the sermon today about how God commands us to respect his word and to 
to keep it in its entirety, not one little part of it will pass away. Okay? So let's pray together before we continue our service. Okay? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity that we have to come here this morning and to worship you. We pray, Father, that you'd be glorified in our worship and remove those distractions from our minds that would keep us from focusing on you and our word. Teach us through your word this morning, Father, as we worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you very much. It's good to see you all. And at this time, I'll call upon our senior choir to bless us in song.
sermon text from Matthew 5, 13 through 20 has already been read in its entirety, but please remain standing as I reread just a portion of it in Jesus' name. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. Sanctify us, make us holy through your word now, Lord. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. O oh, Lord, you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. You may be seated. Good to see you. It's been uh, about eight years since Aaron and I were going to Ruthford on a regular basis. Some things have changed here, some things have not. I was getting some amens in the, from someone here in the, during the 8.30 service during my sermon, and that was a little different than I remembered at Ruthford. I'm grateful to be here with you this morning, and Aaron and the kids were thrilled to be here. My sermon title is uh, Shine Your Light by Standing on the Word. And it was 17 years ago that I came in the front door down there at Ruthford wanting to speak to a pastor about Aaron and me perhaps starting to attend Ruthford Lutheran Church. And I sat in a little office right next to Paula's down the hall there and met with Pastor Dennis. And he said, I can't tell you what church to attend, but I will tell you this. Whatever church you visit, you ask that pastor, where do you stand on God's word? And if he says anything to you other than the Bible is the word of God and it is true from the very first word in Genesis to the very last word in Revelation, don't go to that church. So, Aaron and I, here's another amen. <laughs> we joined Ruthford 16 years ago, and our faith grew immensely in our time here because of the faithful preaching and teaching of the word that we received here. And we saw that too in the lives of the people at Ruthford who shine their light by standing on the word. Many things have changed at Ruthford in 16 years, but that is one thing that has not changed. Ruthford stands firmly on the word. And here in Matthew 5, especially in verses 13 through 16, that's what we see among Jesus' followers. That Jesus isn't hidden in them. He shines through them. In the Beatitudes, those are just before our sermon text, Jesus teaches about how God will bless the people who are faithful to him in spite of persecutions and sufferings that they endure. The Beatitudes deal with God's relation with believers. And these verses here deal with the relation between believers and the people in the world. And what that looks like. What purpose God has for our relationships with other people in the world. And Jesus tells his followers here, he says, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. If you put salt on food and it tastes exactly the same way it did before you added the salt, then the salt is worthless and you might as well just throw it into the street. If you're a believer then it's by God's grace that he grew that faith in you through the saving power of the word of God. And he doesn't save us so that we will be exactly the same as everyone else in the world, exactly the same as we were before, so no one can tell the difference between us and the rest of the world. He saved you, and he has a great purpose for you here in the world. And Jesus said, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. You don't put salt on your permani sandwich 
or on your potato dumplings or your tater tot hot dish up in Roseau, Minnesota, so that it'll taste exactly the same as it did before you put the salt on there. We don't build cities on hills to hide them, and we don't light lamps and then cover them over so it doesn't give any light to the people who are around. And God doesn't do those things either. He has a purpose. Jesus isn't hidden in us. He shines through us. And God gave you his word, which saves. And he lit that lamp of faith in you to save you because he loves you. And so that other people who are lost in spiritual darkness could see Jesus. God saved you not because he only loves you, but so you'd shine that light of Christ so that others could see Jesus too. People around you who are living in darkness, Jesus wants them to find their hope in him too. For God so loved the world, and that does include you, and Jesus clearly says here that he wants to use you to work through you, that others might be saved too. There are so many people around us who are living in spiritual darkness. And how will they call on the one they've not believed in? And how will they believe in the one in whom they've not heard? And how can they hear without someone to preach to them? His saving word isn't only preached and taught within these four walls, at Ruthford Lutheran Church. It's to be preached and taught and lived out in the lives of the believers here, in the lives of the believers here at Ruthford. And when that's happening, that's when Jesus isn't hidden in us, but he shines through us. Jesus says, let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who was in heaven, there should be something different about believers, something different about the way we live, about the way we treat other people that reflects faith in Jesus Christ and glorifies God. Not that it glorifies us. It's not that Ruthford is glorified. It's not like, wow, that congregation there, Ruthford, what a great group of people who just have it all together. They are just, they must naturally just be so much smarter and nicer than everybody else in the world. No. Ruthred people are fantastic. But we struggle too, don't we? Just like everyone else. There isn't a whole lot of sweetness involved, is there, Aaron, in breaking up a fight between a five year old and an eight year old in a minivan on the way to the 8 30 service, right? What makes Ruthred great is not that we are inherently so great, but that our God is great and his word is great. It's our God and his word that make this place great. And verses 17 and 18 clarify that we're not the source of the light that we shine. His word is our light. Jesus says, do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. And you have to remember that the Jewish leaders at this time were accusing Jesus of preaching and teaching against the Old Testament. They were trusting in the scribes and Pharisees, trusted in, remember, their their supposed observance of the law, their following of the law for their salvation. They trusted in their genetic heritage as the sons of Abraham for their salvation. And then Jesus came along, and he called all the scribes and Pharisees sons of hell. And he said that the tax collectors and the prostitutes would get into heaven before them. And then he said that through faith in him, Not only the Jews, but Gentiles would be saved too. And that's what they meant when they accused him of preaching against the Old Testament. That's what abolishing the law and the prophets means. That's what they meant by that. But Jesus says here, he didn't come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And that's exactly what Jesus did. Jesus fulfilled the law when he 
lived a perfect, sinless life, the only one to ever do it, he fulfilled the law of God in that way. And then he fulfilled all the messianic prophecies or the prophets. He fulfilled the, most of the sayings of the, of, the, of the prophets by suffering and dying on the cross and saving us. And he will fulfill the rest when he returns. Jesus fulfilled the law and the prophets. Jesus had to deal with people back then who accused him of preaching, of being anti-Old Testament. And today we deal with people who accuse the Old Testament of being anti-Jesus. And I've heard people say things like, hey, why do we need that Old Testament? You know, we have the New Testament, we have Jesus. Why do we still read that thing? Well, because the New Testament and the disciples and Jesus himself called the Old Testament the Word of God. And they said that it teaches about Jesus. So both the Old and New Testament are God's word, and indeed they are true, from the very first word in Genesis to the very last word in Revelation. His word is our light. And in verses 19 and 20, Jesus encourages and warns us to stay true to the word which saves. He says, whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments, and teaches others to do the same, shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. And it was in 2003 that I first discerned the Lord's call to consider seminary. And I saw this advertisement for Seminary Weekend at Gettysburg Theological Seminary. You could go there for a weekend and stay for free and learn what it might be like to study in seminary there in Gettysburg. And so I went. And within 20 minutes there in Gettysburg, I heard the dean, the instructors, and some of the students saying things like, well... You know, some things in the Bible are historically accurate, but other things like that whole book of Exodus, that didn't really happen. That's just a story that's intended to communicate an important message. And it was by God's grace that I knew what they were saying was evil. And I knew that I was not going to go to that seminary. Gettysburg Theological Seminary is not true to the word which saves. And I came back here to Ruthfrid, and I took then vicar Brent Olson out to lunch at Eaton Park, I told him where I'd been, and he laughed at me over his slice of Oreo cream pie, <laughs> and explained to me the difference, the differences between Gettysburg and the AFLC's seminary. The world naturally rejects the word of God. Just vast swaths of it. They just want to throw it away. And they applaud seminaries and churches and pastors who will join them in that, throwing out those verses of Scripture. And you know how people are. They want rules and laws to apply to everyone else. And then they want to be able to say, well, you know, those rules and laws are important, I know, but in my case, here's why I'm an exception. The natural world likes to look at the Bible that same way. It's called Bible a la carte. Oh, I like this part. I'll take that. Oh, this part here. No, that one convicts me. I'm not a big fan of that. So I'll just reject that and set that aside or rip that out. The world loves theologians and calls them great when they say things like this. Oh, we have a higher understanding today of what that part of God's word meant, means. And that was for that culture at that time. That's, that doesn't apply to us today. To the world, those are the greater theologians, right? But Jesus defies that here. He says that unlike in the world, in the kingdom of heaven, those who are called great are the ones who stay true to the word 
which saves, rather than defying God's word and teaching others to do that too. And if you're a believer, then you are saved by God's grace through his word. That's what he uses. So you'd be washed clean of your sin by the blood of the perfect Lamb of God. And that's the only way anyone is made righteous. Jesus talks about that here. That's the only way that your righteousness will ever exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees is by God's saving work in you through his word. It's his work and his grace that does that, uh, that thing that Jesus says must be done. Your righteousness surpassing that of the scribes and Pharisees. And that's what Jesus means here when he says that. Your righteousness exceeding that, surpassing that, of the scribes and Pharisees doesn't mean you need to be a better person or nicer than those scribes and those Pharisees. No, because in our sinful nature, in our unbelieving state, we are the scribes and Pharisees, aren't we? The righteousness that Jesus says we're to have, these works that he says we're to be doing, shining his light in the world, we can't do any of that in ourselves. Apart from me, you can do nothing, Jesus says. The works you do, which Jesus mentions in these verses, which shine his light into the world, are actually done by God through you. His word says, it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So it's not that God is glorified here at Ruthred because the people here are just so much smarter and nicer than everyone else around us. No, God is glorified when by his grace, a congregation stands on his word and shines his light into a dark world. Many people, and maybe some of you, came to Ruthred in the first place because you either heard or you experienced that this is a place that stands firm on the word which saves, that respects the word of God. And it was 16 years ago that Aaron and I joined Ruthred for that reason. God has miraculously preserved his word for you over thousands of years to save you And so that you would share the word of God, as the old Welsh pastor Christmas Evans put it, so the hearers may may see the glory of Christ and be changed into the same image. Praise God that his word, which saves, is still faithfully preached and taught here at Ruthford. His word, which saves, it's not hidden here at Ruthford, it shines through this congregation. It's the light of this congregation. And by God's grace, Ruthred will remain true to his word. As a result of Ruthred being true to the word over the course of its existence, many souls have been saved. My, all five of my children were baptized here. And by God's grace, Ruthred will remain true to the word which saves, and many more souls will be saved. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard and keep your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, 
but have life everlasting. Amen. Lord Jesus, again, we thank you that you are the light of the world and that you have come into our hearts. And Lord, we pray that you would bless these offerings and use them to shine forth the light of your gospel here and around the world. We pray in your name. Amen. This time, let us please kneel or bow for our closing prayer. Lord Jesus, again, we do thank you that you are the light and that you're willing to come into this world of darkness and to draw us into the light. And Lord, we pray that you would use us to be that witness, that witness unto you the light in our communities, our families, Lord, and literally around the world. We thank you that our church congregation has been able to do that in so many different ways. And we pray, God, that you continue uh, to use and to multiply those efforts and to use our church as a lighthouse, Lord God, as a beacon of light in the darkness. And Lord, we pray especially today for the McMinn family, and we just pray that you would continue to watch over them and keep them in your care. We pray that you would give them safety as they continue to travel and to, to visit family during this time. Lord, that you would bless them. We pray that you would make clear to them as well your call upon them into, into the future. And Lord, that's our prayer as well for uh, Vicar Brian and Allie Westerberg, that you would give them safety and travel, and that you would give them clarity of your call in their life as well. Lord, we pray your blessing upon uh, Bob Christman on his birthday. We just pray you continue to give him strength and uphold him. We pray for Lorraine this morning too, Jesus, that you would give extra strength and healing to her. We pray for John Bender and Dick Thomas, Lord Jesus, that you would minister strength and healing to both those men. We pray also for Judy Boyd and Janine Kruth, that you would minister to them as well, and to Bob Thomas and to Marge Shell, that you would give healing and strength day by day. Lord, we pray that you would minister your peace and your comfort to the Scundrich family today, and also to the Hummel family, as they mourn the loss of, of loved ones, Lord. We just pray, especially you just gather around Deb in just a special way and just uphold Debbie, Lord Jesus, in, in your arms today. Lord, we thank you for our congregation's passion for life, and we pray that you'd help us as we continue to, to partner in, in defending and, and promoting and valuing life here in our community and throughout our nation. 
We pray your hand upon our leaders and the council as they meet tomorrow, that you would fill uh, each one, Lord, with your wisdom, and that you would continue to guide and direct our church. We ask in Jesus' name. We continue to pray in the quietness of our own heart before you. And let us pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.